synucleinopathy. Synucleinopathy is the word of the night, and that is right there. All right, friends, let's begin with the basically the intrigue, as we always have. And this is speculative and purely hypothetical, but is a question being asked, which will lead to many more questions. So let us begin with synucleinopathies. Therefore, a theoretical scenario exists where a certain proportion of people receiving the COVID-19 vaccine, likely from among those with neurological side effects, e.g. severe headaches. And recall what is the number one adverse event reported to VAERS? may exhibit neurological symptoms such as synucleopathies diagnosed as Parkinson's disease and or Lewy body dementia. Are you ready for this? Can you read that? Two to three decades post immunization. Let us begin once again. I don't want to be conspiratorial here. And again, this is a question being asked in regard to research and the research title is as follows. How does severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 affect the brain and its implications for the vaccines currently in use? I'm going to reiterate one more time because I actually had to read this a couple of times to make sure I was understanding it properly. And because the profound impact that it was basically implying, therefore, a theoretical scenario exists where a certain proportion of people receiving the COVID-19 vaccine likely from among, among those with neurological side effects, severe headaches, may exhibit neurological symptoms such as synucleinopathies diagnosed as Parkinson's disease and or Lewy body dementia up to two to three decades post immunization. 20 to 30 years post immunization, hypothetical, conjecture, speculative, well, I want to cover this research towards the end. It was one of our last elements to cover. But yeah, uh, it definitely definitely leads to more questions than answers. So let's set that so we come back to it. Also, too, another real intriguing uh, little bit of research here in reference to the vaccine effectiveness versus Omicron. We will come back to this as well. This is coming from the effectiveness of COVID-19. Vaccines against, vaccines against Omicron or Delta infection, which is appropriately titled. And the one interesting information tidbit here comes from its data table. And the data table has this as follows. You may notice something you're not used to seeing, especially in reference to other vaccines. For example, here, we look at a vaccine effectiveness and keep in mind this confidence interval. For those not familiar, it's a little different than, of course, uh, p-value. So, for example, here, that means 95% of the results or outcomes will fall between negative 94 and 54. Now, looking right here, we're looking at first two doses, mRNA vaccines, and this is versus Omicron. What do you notice there? negative 13, negative 38, negative 42, negative 16. Then we look at the third dose, otherwise appropriately known or commonly known as the booster. And now they're going to four doses, which is the booster's booster. And look at the effectiveness versus Omicron. And look at your confidence interval. 95% of the results are falling between or outcomes between negative 94 and 54 in one of those cases there. You're basically looking at a mean at 2, 34, 5, and 59. We'll come back to this one in a second as well because that really makes mandating inoculations appear to be a highly superfluous light, especially if there's a potential, again, being speculative and hypothetical, if vaccine imprinting is occurring. Because I need to see what these numbers are. Obviously, they're comparing them to unvaccinated groups. And uh, yeah, that's that may lead or may imply, as we said before, vaccine imprinting. And also, well, too, uh, just basically our observational data, because, you know, I'm big into observational data. If you were an alien from another planet and you look at new cases, smooth per million. Remember, this is fully vaccinated per hundred. That was a really good straight line. Fully vaccinated per 100 as of 
brand new year, 2022, and happy new year. And here we are, 0 to 10 out of 100, 11 to 20 out of 100, 21 to 30 out of 100, 31 to 39 out of 100. I don't have to explain to you why this looks odd. You know what I mean? Especially if we basically go back to how can these numbers be so much higher than these numbers? Now, there's questions in reference to seroprevalence and things like that in prior exposure. But when you look at that and you go, hmm, let's look at this again. What does negative vaccine effectiveness potentially have when looking at such data as the following? All right, now what are we going to cover tonight? Let's pip them. Let's look. Here we go. Do, do, do. I always like to start with the positive stuff before we get to the questionable stuff. Because people are often short on time and I'd rather help people than scare people. So let us begin. Severe glutathione deficiency, oxidative stress, and oxidant damage in adults hospitalized with COVID implications for, here we go again, glycine and n acetylcysteine. All right, in order to help with glutathione de deficiency. Great article, but many of you may know that the FDA for a while scared the life out of a lot of people by trying to say n acetylcysteine should be a drug and but we got it back on the market so proceed next one immune response to covid uh, uh seasonal coronaviruses may offer protection against covid 19. so all those people trying to avoid colds think about that all right omicron infection neutralizing immunity against delta variant all right yes so here we go so if the vaccine effective this is really really bad and but people are catching omicron it it may not have the dire uh precedent that people may think and it may actually help i don't like saying getting sick helping people but let's put it this way train the immune system against more harmful variants so does that make any sense and so yeah i mean you know break breakthrough infections things like that are like scary but if you're going to have a breakthrough infection if you choose between all the variants have a breakthrough infection with would you choose omicron all right then to proceed forward, the, the Omicron variant of concern does not readily infect Syrian hamsters. It affects them, but we'll get into the basically, this, this This may take a little bit of mystique away and explain why it doesn't appear to be anywhere near as lethal as the other variants. All right, and then to explain the vaccine effectiveness, we are gonna to refer to this study from Canada in regard to why people, for example, are getting influenza. This is just to give you a brief explanation of vaccine effectiveness. And they were trying to figure out why individuals that were vaccinated were getting a fourfold increase in influenza. Well, no, it was really weird. It all went back, they tied it back, speculative, to the 1968 influenza pandemic when they received a vaccine. And that vaccine primed the immune system in a way which made it have a negative effect on a vaccine many, many decades later, because it's only the age group that was really being affected was 35 to 54. So I had to figure out what was going on that was causing the vaccine not only to fail, but also increase uh, influenza infections upon a certain subgroup. And that was vaccine effectiveness. We'll go into this more detail in a second when we cover the other one. All right, then we need to know this one. How long does the vax, the boosters last? Well, we'll cover that in a second too. It's going to be pretty anticlimactic. All right, hand sanitizer. This is basically a caveat or a, a warning of note. Stop bathing your kids in hand sanitizer is what the researchers are trying to imply. It is not good to bathe children in hand sanitizer. And it'll go into details on why it is not a good thing. And we'll cover that in a second too. I'm trying to stay disciplined and stick with the the order all right here we go and then basically we'll cover doo -doo -doo. uh multi-system inflammatory like syndrome in a child following covid 19 mrna vaccination now this is a really important case study because they they were able to follow what was going on and therefore may be able to help other children but you're going to get into the idea of how the encephalopathy, cytoxic lesions of the corpus calcium and it's increasing, da da da. And when you look at how this affects the neurological aspects of a 
an individual, in this case a child, then this begins to also basically correlate. Now correlation is not causative, but it starts building a pretty strong case uh, in reference to something's going on that was not intended to be going on because you're getting you're getting multiple studies coming in. I remember like last week we did the uh, the severe headaches and migraines, how certain things are affecting neuro people neurologically that should not. And this explains what data was not researched prior to the approval of the vaccines. All right, and also too, our data sources as follows. Very important to be respectful. The European Endurvigilance uh, European Database, uh, the database is rolling over. So all I have is the total reports to your vigilance. I can't go to the severe because this this first part of the week, there were no new reports. But what I'll start doing is adding those reports together, merging databases between 2021 and 2022, so we can get a, a good bearing. But endure vigilance and then VAERS, and here's our disclaimer. Disclaimer being, and we go through it every time, while being very important, monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to adverse events or illness. These reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. In large part, reports of errors were voluntarily and subject to biases. And I cannot stress enough that a lot of individuals, well-meaning individuals, are trying to interpret errors and then not removing the duplicate reports, giving them really, really wonky mortality rates. Doesn't mean the mortality rates are not higher or lower. But on the, at least in the specific data being reported to VAERS, they may be counting the same person two or three times. Now, the argument that only 1% of the cases reported to VAERS can still hold, but working from the database itself, uh, they're misinterpreting the data as they're reading it from the database and they're duplicating reports, which are making things look wonky. All right, outside of that, GSISA, thank goodness for them because they help us track the variants, which we'd never know about any of them if it probably wasn't for these people. And then also our world and data, which uses the GIS aid and is probably one of the best data collections out there maintained by Oxford University. So let us begin before we start speaking really monotone. And the first one, the first one to help. Severe glutathione deficiency, oxidative stress and oxidant damage in adults hospitalized with COVID-19 implications for Glynac glycine and acetylcysteine. I did a video report on that a little while ago in reference to, I believe, uh, mitigating the effects of aging and real important, but then acetylcysteine was trying to be banned by the FDA about a month or two ago. And, but here it is. So let us begin. Ba -ba. Really cool what they did. So when you see GSH here, here, just as a heads up, I know it doesn't make sense, but I want you to see that GSH means glutathione. So keep in mind when you see GSH, it is glutathione, so you don't get lost. All right, so basically, as we see down, and they notice this correlation that in younger individuals, especially, why were they so prone to COVID? It didn't make any sense. Well, in the younger individuals, what they notice is the glutathione levels were really freaking low. And so you can go through all the here, and you can see that. Now, what caused the glutathione levels to be low? All right, that could be, you know, you'd say immune system, whatever it is, but that's, in, that's beside the point. The point is to say, well, what if we bring those glutathione levels back up? And that leads to a hypothetical uh, potential prophylactic treatment, potentially, but still hypothetical. So let us take out the highlight. Glutathione levels have been reported to be inversely related to multimorbidity in older adults, OA. So remember OA, they want to go through that a couple of times too, just a heads up. It is established that OA and the geriatric age group have been increased prevalence of glutathione deficiency. Therefore, oh wait, you're right. Therefore, the findings of this study are interesting because they show a much more widespread prevalence of glutathione deficiency in all age groups of adult humans. I love this. Adult humans. So again, just to be specific, we're talking the right adult. Adult humans hospitalized with COVID-19, especially in younger humans. You ever feel like you're part of a lab experiment? Oh, there you are. This is an important discovery because younger humans are not expected to have glutathione deficiency, but we found that patients in the 21 to 40 
and the 41 to 60 year age groups have severe glutathione deficiency compared to unaffected age match controls. Older adults, OA, with acutely infected with COVID-19 have the highest rates of hospitalization and mortality. In our study, we found, I'll raise this up just a little bit. We found that older adults hospitalized with COVID-19 at the lowest glutathione concentrations. With glutathione levels lower than unaffected age match controls, older adults suggest that when older humans are infected with COVID-19, older humans, be specific, their glutathione levels decline even further. So they're already critically low. And then it just pushes them right over the ledge. Collectively, these data indicate that glutathione deficiency is highly prevalent in patients admitted to hospitals due to COVID-19. And then we scroll down. Doo -doo -doo. The benefits of glynac, glycine, and N-acetylcysteine, we're not giving it a dosage here. They're just saying, hey, this is what we're looking at. The benefits of glycine and N-acetylcysteine supplementation because of glutathione go well beyond correcting glutathione deficiency and OXS. Also, it is important inflammation and pro important. Now, where, where am I reading important when this improves? It also improves inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, endothelial vascular dysfunction, insulin resistance, genotoxicity, toxicity, autophagy, I want to say autophagy, but it's autophagy, and muscle strength as reported in human clinical trials. So they're really saying you really can't lose. This is relevant because similar defects are also important in patients with COVID-19. So if you got COVID, a little bit of glutathione and endocytocysteine may be able to prove all these, which pretty much happen during this. This is relevant because similar defects are important in patients with COVID-19. Overall, the combination of the findings of the study and the observations on the potential benefits of Glynac supplementation in prior clinical trials suggest a potentially beneficial role for Glynac supplementation in COVID-19 infected patients and supports the need for research to evaluate the impact of Glynac supplementation in COVID-19. That is a pretty cool study. Now, one of the videos I did a while ago, I believe in reference to aging mitigation, may have went through the dosages they use for that. And again, this is a different scenario, looking for a different outcome. So the same dosages made it apply, but still just the same. Pretty cool. And they looked at a ventilated COVID-19 patients here. And of course, I'll have a link for you there. So you can go to these references as well. But just two patients, don't make a huge... Um, Statistical power rating, let's put it that way. All right, next. Da, da, da. We're just confirming data. This is article number, what, 15 we've covered over the past year. And I'm just going to read the title just because it reiterates over and over again. Immune response to seasonal coronaviruses such as, i.e. common cold, may offer protection against COVID-19, which is kind of the reason why kids in daycares and things like that used to get colds a lot as a kid. It basically, as the famous George Carlin once said, strains the immune system. Link will be there just so you can reiterate uh, the other links on the exact same subject. All right, here we go. Next, Omicron infection enhances neutralizing immunity against the Delta variant. If there was one, this really leads to a perplexing question. Do you expose people to the risk of Omicron in order to reduce them from the risk of the Delta variant? And again, that's interesting. But again, if you expose a person to the risk of an adverse effect to an inoculation, and basically Omicron is working like with a, a, a natural, I don't want to say anything natural per se, but you know what I mean, uh, environmental inoculation, then risk is risk. The question is, which is riskier, Omicron or anything reduced by a major uh, corporation? Here we go. Neutralization of Omicron increased 14-fold over this time showing development of antibody response to the variant. Importantly, there was an enhancement to Delta virus neutralization, which is a good thing. Not an enhancement to the Delta virus, enhancement of Delta virus neutralization, which increased 4.4 fold. The increase in Delta variant neutralization in individuals infected with Omicron may result in dec decreased ability of Delta to reinfect those individuals. Along with emerging data indicating that Omicron at this time in the pandemic is less pathogenic than Delta. Such an outcome may have a positive 
implications in terms of decreasing COVID-19 burden of severe diseases. Now, in a little bit, we'll look at the data. Let's say, for example, let's just, let's, let me scroll down real fast, see real fast if there's anything else here. All right, here we go. These results are consistent with Omicron displacing the Delta variant since it can elicit which neutralizes Delta, making reinfection with Delta less likely. In contrast, Omicron escapes neutralizing immunity elicited by Delta and therefore may reinfect Delta infected individuals. So it's like a viral pathogen replacement, except you have two viruses which apparently are having some sort of covert war between each other. Infected individuals, this implication such as displacement would depend on whether Omicron is indeed less pathogenic than Delta. If so, the incidence of COVID-19 severe disease would be reduced and the infection may shift to become less disruptive to individuals in society, i.e. common cold. All right, now check this out. Well, we'll look at, for example, real fast, look at some of the data. Let's look at the data from um, ba -ba 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 right here. All right, let's see what pops up. I want to show you the data on Florida. All right, here we go. This is important because this plays into the Omicron thing. Uh, just to give you a real fast look. All right, here we go. Look at that. Look at the cases per thousand. Look at the Florida. See the Florida? Look at the Florida. Look at the Florida. Look at the cases across the board. Let's look at the four weeks. Let's look back further. Look at the Florida. There it is. Now, if we look at Delta, if we look at Florida, and we act the exact same way the the media plays a role, which is totally lacking in brain plasticity, and they're kind of a cast system to me. So basically, one brain, one media. I don't care which channel it's on. Uh, they lack brain plasticity. So what happens is. They're looking at this, looking at uh, version D614G, right? The original, the one of the original variants. Let's look at the mortality rate. All right, so we go back, boom, boom, boom. Look at that, zoom, right up there. All of them are skyrocketing. But let's look at the mortality. Let's just so you can get a look at, so back it up. There's Florida. You said huge zoom, and the mortality rate, less than California, less than New York even less than Texas, but even Texas is less than New York. And so basically you look at all these vaccine mandates, these distancing, these cancellation at birthday parties, children living in isolation, as well as seniors, so on and so forth, not going to school, all obviously not based upon observational science. So look at this, world coming to an end, ah, all right? And then all of a sudden, hey, so guess what? When the hospital, when the conjecture, the speculation or hypothesis is postulated as such, this may be actually pretty accurate. So next, let's go to our Syrian hamsters, which are used in all of the, of the trials. And here we go. The Omicron sars cov 2 variant of concern does not readily infect Syrian hamsters. And let's go real fast. This will give you a good idea real fast. Da -da. Look at this. All right, come on, get that thing down there. There it is, now I'll go back up. All right, look at that. That's Omicron. What's that? Lung, copies, copies. And of course, the weight is actually pretty good. So, you know, obviously indicative of illness. Obviously, VELSA2, that's very poor mice, but still just the same. Infectious virus teeters, titers, teeters. Uh, Vomicron versus others, you tell me. Now you can understand why. It's infecting, but it doesn't seem to be having the same impact uh, on the internal organs as other elements in play do. So let's go back up to the top. Strikingly, in hamsters that have been infected with Omicron variant, a lower viral RNA load was detected in lungs as compared lower. That was an understatement. Lungs as compared to animals infected with, remember there it is, D614G. Good luck finding it these days. And no infectious viruses were detectable in this organ. So let's scroll down. Because again, now Omicron, you hear a lot about it and people are still thinking D641G. And oh, there's nothing else there. Nothing else left to go by. Um, but... It's like, well, let's look at this one real fast. I didn't look at it yet. Yeah, see, look, it's like, it's like there compared to 
uh, well, ironically, which is an arrow. But otherwise, outside of that, and you know, that's D6414G, if you don't recall, D6414G uh, was the original variant, uh, which seemed to be a lot more uh, reactive in the body. And you have Omicron down here compared to that. And uh, that's it. I mean, what more can you really say? It just basically, yeah, it's infectious, but it's not really the same as the other variants. You know, that one thing is not like the others. After that, up, 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 here we go. This is perfect. This goes down to the vaccine effectiveness, all right? So what we're gonna do here, I was gonna review this first because people aren't aware of the fact is a vaccine is a medicine. It's it's it, all because it, it, it's called a vaccine. It does not give it some miraculous ability where you cannot question it. And so the Canadians actually did a good job and looked at the research of what happened here. And this will give you, this will lead you to what the V means, vaccine effectiveness. Paradoxical clad, clade, age-specific vaccine effectiveness during the 2018-19 influenza, AH3N2 epidemic of Canada, a potential imprint. Remember, I use that word a lot, imprinting. You may understand that, but you're going to hear it, start hearing it probably the next two or three years a lot more. Imprinted, regulated, effective vaccine. And here we go. Are you ready? Hopefully this is uh, renders to 4K, so you can read this okay. Vaccine effectiveness, that word there. For 2018-19 influenza, H3N2 epidemic, aim to explain a paradox. Let's go make this bigger. Oh, there. Got it. Perfect. All right. Aim to explain the paradoxal signal of increased uh, 3C among risk between 35 to 54. So this age group, it was a mystery to them. Why were they getting sicker than the unvaccinated? Vaccinees. We hypothesize childhood immunological imprinting, remember that word, it's going to become popular, and a cohort effect following the 1968 influenza AH392 pandemic. All right, so you see this here, the vaccine effectiveness, negative 32%, negative 96%. Uh, we're going to start seeing those numbers in a few seconds as well. The vaccine effectiveness showed a pronounced negative dip among 35 to 54 year olds in whom the odds of medically attended illnesses were greater than fourfold increased for vaccinated versus unvaccinated participants. This age group was primed in childhood to influenza H3N2 viruses that for two decades following the 1968 pandemic bore a serene hemoglobin position. Da, da, da. Come on, you get the point. Da, 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 da. Our findings suggest vaccine mismatch may negatively interact with imprinted immunity. The immunological mechanisms for imprint regulated effective vaccine warrant investigation. So the weird part about it is what ends up happening is even though the, vac the vaccine may have wore off potentially, but the weird part about it is that decades, decades later, uh, that's almost impossible to read, certain age groups uh, are still affected. So to think the power of a vaccine is that strong where if they math mess up, that you can end up having people getting sicker and not healthier. And now compound that with, for example, children expected to get an untold number of vaccines every year now for who knows how long, uh, you can see the complication in the future of developing a vaccine when you need to. All right, but now that ties into this one right here. So remember that negative 96, you see that right there? Negative 96, negative 32, and so on and so forth. Now, look at this. Remember it resulted in a fourfold increase. Double vaccinated individuals, and you see here. Nowhere near as strong as a negative effect in this but you can see the negative effect in this leads to increased potentially of infection of Omicron right there. And that's the 95% confidence interval. So some of these areas, 120 days to 179 days, 240 days, uh, 60 to 119 days. Why? Why is it doing that? And how long does this last? And then they hit with the third booster yeah, it seems to pop it up a little bit, 
but it's like seriously even if you i mean it's like that is what you're terminating people for and their jobs and terrifying people between the vaccinated and unvaccinated trying to develop some sort of caste system it, you, wow they're uh, they're uh, wow they have some challenges to, to mentally to um overcome but let's get into this research as well too i just wanted to show you that well well very well documented data they said it very diplomatically and let's go to the top and go back down real fast they said quote let's go vaccine effectiveness against omicron was 37 percent averaging it all out about seven days after receiving the mrna vaccine for the third dose so seven days after you about 37 percent all right, so how many times do you have to, how many people do you have to vaccinate in order to prevent one infection? Number needed to uh, inoculate. Let's call it that way. All right, in conclusion, two doses of COVID-19 vaccines are unlikely to protect against infection by Omicron. Unlikely is an understatement. A third dose provides some protection in the immediate term, but substantially less than against Delta. Understatement. Our results may be confounded by behaviors that we're unable to account for in our analysis. Now, I believe them. They, what they said is, well, maybe the vaccine are getting more infected because they're going to they're going to be more social, not mass, not distance, and so on and so forth. And that makes perfect sense if the data also applied to Delta. Further, research is needed to examine protection against severe outcomes. Scroll down. Da 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 da. da. In contrast, receipt of two doses of COVID-19 vaccines was not, not saying maybe, was not. See how the words change as you read down? Of Omicron infection at any at any point in time, not protective at any point in time. And so, yeah, you're going to mandate that on people. And vaccine effectiveness was negative 38 percent, 120 to 79 days, negative 42 percent, 180 to 239 days. Remember what negative means after the second dose. Vaccine effectiveness of Omicron was 37 percent, seven days of receiving MRI for the third dose. Findings were consistent with combination of two minority vaccines, two doses that die for primary series. Da, 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 da. You get the you get the point. And then mRNA vaccines made long. Um, what to say here? Let's begin. Our findings have potential implications for proof of vaccination requirements. Remember, it's not about the vaccine against the vaccine. It's about the immune against the non-immune. If you want to pit people against each other. If the goal of these policies is to protect against infection, then individuals who have received two doses of mRNA vaccines may no longer be considered fully vaccinated. Ba -ba -ba. However, if the primary goal of these policies is to protect against severe illness and impact on the health system, further data will be needed to determine if the number of doses required to provide adequate protection against severe outcomes caused by Omicron. Our work adds to an emergent body of research that's on confidence building a lot suggests that immunization status cannot be simply dichotomized and the protection is instead based on a variety of factors such as type of vaccine received, age or recipient, time of the last dose, and circulated variant. So all these people are just basically talking like they know what they're talking about, which I don't, that's what I'm reading. Uh, but basically, you know, let's say on the media, uh, they need to uh, basically, how would you describe buffer their words with room for uncertainty. And so far, you know, they spoke with incredible confidence uh, and they're still speaking with incredible confidence, uh, even outside of the observational data and the data which is being conducted today, which is really bizarre. They, uh, unfortunately, my, my humble opinion I don't see them fit for leadership positions. All right, after that, ba -ba -ba, let's see if there's anything else. Scroll down. Do, 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 Yeah, and there you have your negative vaccine effectiveness, and now you know what a confidence interval is. All right, so here we go. Next, do the other study. Ba -ba -ba. We'll leave off. And now, does this make sense? The fourfold increase for vaccine individuals when you see these negative uh, vaccine effectiveness uh, in regard to how it left these individuals between um, between the ages of 35 and 54 at a f greater than fourfold increase for infection from influenza due to a vaccine that they had during childhood. Boo for thought. And now how long do those boosters last? How long do you get the benefit of that massive 37% boost? Uh, 
Delta variant dominant period in Israel. We found that this viral load reduction effectiveness significantly declines within months post boost the boost post the boost to dose. Adjusting for age, sex, and calendric date and date calendric date. The CT values of RT RPG initially increased by 2.7 relative to unvaccinated in the first month post the booster dose. Booster dose, yet then decayed to a difference of 1.3. Sounds technical. In the second month, it became ready small and insignificant. <laughs> that sounds so bad. In the third to fourth months. So there's your answer. So now, if you're looking. We read last week that it may require revaccination every four months. Now it just gets silly. Now it just gets really silly. So now in order to maintain the same line of reasoning and arguing that's being considered outside of the massive seroprevalence, prevalence, which is basically uh, out there, I think like now in the U.S., you know, anywhere between 70 and 80 percent of the population to be exposed to one of two things, either vaccination or basically the virus itself. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a practice in futility. The rate and magnitude of this post booster decline in the viral load reduction effectiveness mirror those observed post the second vaccine. These results suggest the rapid waning of the boosters effectiveness in reducing infectiousness possibly affecting community level spread of the virus. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. Again, I utilize the word seroprevalence. You could wear you could wear a mask all the time, but I don't know how much a mask would work after two years of potential exposure. Throw people in a tube that's 30,000 feet in the air and I really question the effectiveness itself. But again, I question a lot of things. So let's begin after that. Ba -ba -bom. Analysts of consumer exposure to cases for alcohol basis affected a hand sanitizer use against coronavirus disease in 2019. All right, over and over again, they came up. Soap and water did a great job. Soap and water, soap and water did beautiful uh, as far as uh, mitigating the effect of sars cov tail But somebody, somebody, i.e., Centers for Disease Control and World Health Organization decided to go out on their own and say, hey, alcohol-based sanitizer worked just as well. Not thinking that the soap and water thing may have been great or it's a potential outcome, or maybe they didn't, just didn't care, uh, on a large swath of our younger people, i.e. younger humans, may have an impact in society. So let us proceed with this article. About half the total cases involve children. Number of exposure, growth, this is people that hand sanitizer overdose, and I'm not talking about drinking it. Uh, if you see the word ingestion, that means bringing it through the skin. All right. About half the total cases involve children less than 10 years old, and 97% of those exposures per year with unintentional. In addition, I'd scary about the 3% that are, in addition, the most common exposure site was the patient's own residence, home. Overexposure, disinfectants, and hand sanitizer can cause symptoms such as burning and irritation of the eyes, nose and throat, coughing, chest nice, chest niceness, chest tightness, headache, choking, and in severe cases, death. So basically, you could see someone that's been washed in hand sanitizer may appear sick, especially the younger human, but they're not. They're just being intoxicated. So let's proceed forward. The Center for Disease Control, all right, yeah, and they're all, they're all mighty wisdom, and, you know, it's okay to be wrong. And that's what, you know, if you're wrong, stop it. So if you're wrong, stop recommending it. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers are mainly made of ethanol, isopropyl alcohols, and hydrogen peroxides in different combinations. Formulas made from these components may be toxic to human health when used in excessive amounts or abused. And then we scroll down. Ba -ba -ba. Despite the proven efficacy of alcohol-based products, the delayed acceptance in some hospitals was due to concerns that repeated use can lead to excessive dryness of skin. Medical professionals. Alcohol kills bacteria in most viruses by removing oil from the skin and instantly modifying its protein structure. But alcohol remains on the skin for at least 30 seconds. 
In order to minimize harmful damage from the remnant alcohol left on our hands, use of disinfectants and hand sanitizers should be combined with regular hand washing. So the irony is, once you use your alcohol-based hand sanitizer, you got to go wash your hands with soap and water. Alcohol-dated products not only damage the skin, but dangerous long-term or lethal effects can occur due to accidental alcohol ingestion prior to its complete evaporation. Meaning those poor children, which are being disinfected on a regular basis, and having these disinfectant sprayed in classrooms, maybe have untold collateral effects. All right, we go through there. Da 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 da. da, da. And that was it. Again, I'll have links to this research as well too. Uh, real important, especially if you know children being uh, bathed daily in uh, pan sanitizer. All right, after that, here we go. Multi-system inflammatory-like syndrome in child following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination. This is an important article because it gives away a potential pathway uh, to how these harms may ensue. And this is from Harvard Medical School or Boston Children's Hospital. All right, let's begin. Three weeks after hospital discharge, all of his symptoms, I wanted to read this first. So the child we're about to read about um, recovered. And this all happened after the second dose of this particular vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine. All the symptoms developed within 24 hours and neurological symptoms began to arise. And so synucleopathic, uh as we read before in the article to start. This is a different article, but this gives you a lead in. All right, our reports highlight a potential role of mRNA vaccine induced immunity leading to MIS C like symptoms with cardiac involvement and a CL, like I don't want to say corpus callosum, in a recently vac. Am I pronouncing that right? Corpus callosum? Uh, in recently vaccinated child in the complexity of establishing a casual or causal, I should say casual, it's causal association with vaccination. I would still, I wouldn't even say causal. I'd say maybe a strong correlation. But again, if it's causal, that's a, that's a, that, that's a big, big, big word. And for that word to even be incorporated uh, from Harvard Medical School or Boston's Children's Hospital, uh, they have there some pretty significant information. Encephalopathy with cytotoxic, cytotoxic lesions from corpus callosum is increasingly being recognized and associated with COVID-19 in children and adolescents. The corpus callosum are non-specific, non-enhancing areas, reducing diffusity and indicating cytotoxic edema of non-vascular origin that have been observed in many pediatric infectious and non-infectious diseases. Uh, corpus callosum have also been detected following mumps vaccination. All these things about vaccinations that you just never heard about before because, oh, they're all perfectly safe. No, no they got risk. The question is, is the risk outweigh the benefit, which is attenuated live viruses. Multi-inflammatory syndrome, a multi-system inflammatory syndrome, MIS, in children, so the C just means children, is severe hyperinflammatory syndrome that is temporarily following SARS-2 infection by three to six weeks, presumably post-infectious. As of November 1st, 2021, there have been 5,973 cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children following SARS-CoV-2 and related deaths. The Brighton Calibration Working Group recently proposed a case definition following COVID-19 vaccination. All right, not saying one is related to the other, but you could begin to draw some lines here. Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination has been reported in pediatric patients. Neither had neurological involvement. We conducted an extensive evaluation here of one case. We wanted to find out what was going on of a 12-year-old boy who developed neurological and cardiac involvement following his second COVID-19 vaccination. So again, the child got better, but keep in mind, let's proceed. Brain scans, whole lineup. Toll receptors like, which are here, this is where it gets interesting. This is gonna play into the, the Parkinson's hyperbole. Are you ready? Toll-like receptors, which are activated, by mRNA vaccines cause significant changes in cytokine and gene expression beginning with an hours after receptor activation, then peak within six to 24 hours and subside over the following 48 to 168 hours, consistent with the patient's disease timeline. And again, you know the conclusion to that, 
but now you begin to see there are some issues occurring that look like um, you have not just that we know of, but this, which is intriguing. All right, so now we go to the next one. And this is the one we, we, we let off with. How does severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus is to affect the brain and its implications for the vaccines currently in use? Proceed down. And we go down, 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 down. And we started off what we let off in the first part of the, our, our basic your video. Therefore, a theoretical scenario exists where a certain proportion of people receiving a COVID-19 vaccine, likely from among those with neurological side effects, i.e. or EEG, severe headaches, may exhibit neurological symptoms of synucleopathies, 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 diagnosed as Parkinson's and or Lewy body dementia up to two to three decades post immunization. Now, when you see this and neurological symptoms, now you get concerned basically and not to install fear because again, it all, but still, uh, uh, the, the inoculation of children is, is a real touchy subject. But when you see this, you have to include this into your risk benefit analysis. Because if you bury your hand, in the, bury your head in the sand with the intent, extremely low at this point in time, risk to benefit ratio or marginal, seriously, do you really want to be going there to proceed? Of interest is the mode of action of COVID-19 vaccines currently used, where the end input is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the intended target being antigen-presenting cells of the immune system. However, there are indications that the spike protein generated by these vaccines may have off-target effects. There is no evidence, on a little further, that distribution and or toxic kinetic studies of the spike protein were performed. Again, there is no evidence that distribution and or toxic kinetic studies of the spike protein were performed. With this in mind, it would be prudent to follow up subjects who experience neurological side effects as a result of COVID-19 vaccines. Now, that's all they're doing is they're asking for studies to be conducted. With the COVID-19 vaccines, an assumption was made, an assumption was made that the spike protein, let's move this up a little bit, the spike protein produced in host cells would not be shed in the systemic circulation. Hence, additional data are required to determine the toxicity and distribution of the spike protein, which is already known to cause disease. The guidance for industry that perhaps should have been used, past tense, preclinical assessment of investigational cellular and gene therapy products, although the development and licensure of vaccines prevent COVID-19 guidance for industry, in which the recommendations were also non-binding, the former guidance does recommend more extensive non-clinical studies, including full histopathology and introduction states. The Center for Biologi Biologics Evaluation Research Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapeutics is issuing this guidance to provide sponsors and individuals that design and implement preclinical studies with the recommendations on the substance and scope of preclinical information needed to support clinical trials for investigational cellular therapies, gene therapies, therapeutic vaccines, xenotransplantation, and certain biological device combination products, which OCTGT reviews, which again, we went to the Office for Biological Evaluation and Research and Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Thera Therapies, OCTG, uh, reviews here and after referred to as CGT products. Unlike such definitive studies are carried out and results substantiated until, please forgive me, such definitive studies are carried out and results sustained. It lends consideration for caution when deciding to, whether to administer the COVID-19 vaccine to younger age groups. How much more specific can you get than that? Because if all these things are beginning to correlate, 
you imagine if this end up being, uh, you know, the implications? I don't want to add more publisher bias than needs to in that. Especially when looking at basically children, for example, now they're following out, finding out things like this are potentially occurring and they don't know why. All did this child had Lyme disease, they drew no relationship between the two. Can you imagine that? To be bureaucratic grandstanding now when especially you have a vaccine which shows a negative vaccine effectiveness, not counting the age groups of which may in some confounding there, negative vaccine effectiveness may actually offer a little bit of protection, potentially, and then in a low risk group, i.e. young humans per se, uh, you're gonna do that you're going to go there seriously uh, without doing any further studies or even having studies designed to follow up on these potential neurological hy uh, hypothesis or speculation or conjecture. Wow. Just wow. All right, with that in mind, let's get into the data analysis as follows. Here we go. Ba -ba -boom. Do -do -do. All right, we got the Florida thing out of the way. We noticed Florida. We noticed that giant spike. Do -do -do. And then we notice, for example, the mortality rates may be playing out directly in the role with the correlations being uh, speculated into the research that we just covered earlier. Again, low mandate, low mask, Florida. Observational data does not support, unless there's other confounding involved, the mitigation strategies being used by more stringent states. All right, we go back to the front there. Actually, we go all year. Yeah, and there you see it. Uh, but again, selection bias is wonderful for taking little segments at a time. And I'm sure they'll be looking at this and terrifying the light out of adults and younger humans. All right. But also, too, at the same time, how are we doing mortality wise? All right. When we started this, we had a mortality rate about 2.84 back in boy, that April 15, 2020. And we are at a mortality rate of about 2.46. Wow. Yeah, just wow. Oh, yeah, medical science sure is treating it better. But again, yeah. All right, interesting. All right, to the top, and this is all the hospital information. We go in next week. Da da da. I move a little faster for time. Mortality rate, age breakdown as of the, have again, once again, say it twice. Happy New Year 2022. And there we are. And da, 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 da. there's our age breakdown per se. And we bring that to like a bubble chart. There's the people being most effective. These individuals right here, this is the mortality. I want you to think, and I don't like the fact they spread that between there, you see what I mean? The 24 or 15, CDC needs to break that up a little better. Uh, but you really you really want to do go there with the um, until the research is done. Uh, at least in reference to potentially uh, elements in the blood brain barrier. All right, proceed forward. Uh, let's go to doo -doo -doo, the rebuild here. All right, so let's see what we got here. Give it a second. Come on, or a second or more. There we go. Boom. All right, here we are. Those are the individuals uh, reports the mortality within one day of inoculation. And again, if you want to read that, I'll slow down and move over a few of them. The most important aspect is to recognize that these are real individuals. And this is their stories. And then, you know, and these are the people within a day of the shots, at least according to Veras. All right. These are reports reported to Veras. So that means they were dead in inoculation. And then within a day or so, or if not that day, uh, mortality quickly followed. And so again, that's real stuff. These are long range, 11 days or more. These are all individuals. I always want to be curious about this anomaly here. Um, but yeah, uh, it's like, 
I actually administer the vaccine to the person in the driver's seat first? Yeah, again, huh? You can read through these, and again, it's it's like a novel. But again, they all have IDs, and so you could save them to read them. But keep in mind, be respectful. These are actual real people. And, um, you know, all because they didn't die doesn't mean not bad things didn't happen. Uh, if we look at the individuals which actually suffered mortality, uh, you know, you could read through that. And again, the real individuals, um, you know, it's, it's tough to read from time to time. Begin. Individuals that uh, passed within 10 days of the shot, 3,036. And there we are, as you read through that. And as you go down even further and further, um, again, these are people. And um, you got to take it all into account. And so what we're looking at here, we're looking at, I didn't do the full amount here. Let's go down. Uh, total of reports to VARES is 698,193. I know there's been a slight adjustment. Some anom anomalies like that, which really kind of stand out, especially along children. So we're looking here, for example. So you're looking at that bin there between 16 and 17. And that's a weird spike in age. It's also a weird, uh, so then that 12 month period of time, all of a sudden you have the spike. Now, it's really weird because, again, you would expect more here, but again, not knowing the numbers being vaccinated, it's, it's kind of tough to get an actual ratio. And then, for example, those individuals, the mortality, is at 9,607 reports to VARES. Now, if we look at this, for example, we're going to look at the, um, this is a 2D histogram discrete map. You see this anomaly right there for no apparent reason? Uh, mortality reports, for whatever reason, come out to 200 days. Let's narrow this a little bit. And then when you see this here, it doesn't mean there was negative because of your example, it's only, it's, it's the numbers based along a contour line. Uh, but yeah, this 9.5 days has a real, real uh, interesting uh, anomaly because you would expect more between day zero or day one but no you get this thing right there at the 9.5 day range which is really an unusual anomaly so close to 10 days afterwards you got a hot spot all right let's go down here these are the myocard uh, myocarditis reports to varus at 3773 you notice this trend right here uh this is the age right there it went up and then all of a sudden for a reason it started going to younger and younger groups it wasn't the amount of myocarditis it was still being reported heavily but all of a sudden for some unusual reason it began to go down further and further and further and stayed at a lower group and appeared to uh, go less and less towards the higher elements uh, this is the myocarditis reports look at this right there you see that age thing let's see if i highlight that for you you see that that's what concerns researchers is why that hot spot. You have a hot spot here too, which would be more con in indicative of background amounts, meaning just amounts that happen normally. But wow. All right, so let's look at this a little closer. Look at the way. And we're just narrowing down. The thing will catch up. There we go. And you can see right here the age. You can see all the cases of myocarditis. Think of this like a, a topography map. And so, for example, this is your altitude. But whatever it is right here is an extremely high number down here. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the, the font color properly, but you can see right there. Is that interesting or what? And that's pretty substantial. And so, yeah, as you can see, back it back away. Oops, it's actually bringing the other one there. And then 
yeah, that's about as close. I'm going to, I'll reset that later on, but you can see exactly where it goes with the numbers. These numbers all represent reports. And that's it for that one. And then let us go into, we did that, we did VARES. Let's look at Europe. Again, the amount of reports to Europe right now is at 1,327,876. And I'll next week, when when uh, Dura Vigilance updates for the week, I'll start combining, then we can look at serious reactions. But there'll be no difference in serious reactions of reported this week compared to next week because we're now into the 2022 bin. And they don't continue it. They just begin now at 2022. So I have to merge something called data frames. Now for mutations. Are you ready? Here we go. And so we're looking at the effect of Omicron mutations. Let's give it a second here. Or two. Or three. Here we are. Thank goodness. All right. Let's look at the top here. Correlation. I was amazed by this. Correlation between people fully vaccinated and cases per million. You see right there. All right. And then da da. Total cases per million. Again, the bottom part is people vaccinated per hundred. You can see right there. This part is befuddling, especially since the reproduction rate is so high here, but not uh, not equating to the outcomes of new cases per per million as you are getting in the highly vaccinated individuals. Now, vaccine effectiveness is negative. That would explain a lot, wouldn't it? Mortality per million. So if we look at the states real fast, if we look at this right here. Come on, come up there. What you'll do, uh, Plowley's not cooperating here. There it goes. So for example, there's your fully vaccinated here. Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, Kyrgyzstan, Libya. Bangladesh, Bulgaria, Guatemala, Lebanon, Palestine, South Africa, and Tajikistan. And so there you are. And South Africa was basically the launching place for Omicron. And so, again, uh, correlation of the data. Go past here, Denmark, new cases per million. Look where Denmark is in reference to vaccination. And you see that there? And then we'll run a little slow there. Then Spain, United Kingdom. And look at all the other cases which are vaccinated less and have a lower new cases per million. That chart begin to make sense? All right, and let's scroll down. Eventually. Let's go through here. And then vaccines, vaccination rate. Uh, we looked at that, the people fully vaccinated. I'm speeding through because I'm worried that it's going to freeze. Singapore, positivity rates. Um, Why did they stop keeping track of the numbers? That's weird. They should positivity rate should still be increasing, but interesting. There is the Belgian positivity rate, but Singapore stopped keeping track. Intriguing. All right. Uh, cases per million, though, went down, which is good. And Belgium, anomaly cases per million. And then I think that's all the data we have. Oh, almost forgot. All right, here's Poland. Poland's always ahead of the game in reference to uh, sequences. They've had a little bit of Omicron there. You see right there. And then let's look what happened here last week, the 27th of December. Omicron. Right here, you notice in all those places. Let's go backwards a little bit. Before, uh, Omicron, there it is. South Africa, Mozambique, Ghana. Omicron here again. Look at this. Then you start seeing it begin to spread. And then we go Omicron here. This most recent one. And look at the United States. 42.66% of the sequences. United Kingdom, 61.21. Peru, 100%. Oman, 100%. Morocco, close to 100%. Uh, Malta, Malawi, Jordan, Iran, Botswana, Australia, with all the lockdowns, it's out 74.52% of the sequences. Uh, where's Austria? Austria's not there? No, it's not there. 
and India, which I expected would have ravaged, but it did not. There was India there last the week before, it was 3.48. Then India moved to 47.13. That give you an idea of the replication rate from the 13th of uh, December to the 27th. You see what I mean? And then all the way down the line. And then generally, we'll be closing out the VARES file for uh, maybe next week, I think we will. Give it a second to catch back up. Here we are. Our VARES file, zip file, all the reports for 2021 at 170 megabytes compared to 122 for the three decades prior. To give you an idea what that looks like. Let's say each year. Do, do, do. So there we are. That's all the years prior, and that's VARES, just this year alone. And it is actually, if we look at it, it is 38.98% greater this year than the three decades prior. You'll, you know, so again, that's why that looks so astounding when you compare them year to year. And that's all our reports for 2021. These are all our reports for all the years prior. And that's a great place to lead into because as we look at the various data set, for example, as we go forward, if you look at this just for validation, because I know it's unbelievable, but there it is, 2021. There is the size of your zip file. Compare it to all the years prior. It's so much bigger than the th first three decades. And for some unusual reason, people don't see anything wrong with that. I don't know how they could be sitting at their desk, not terrified day in, day out about this high level of uncertainty. I don't know how they rationalize going, oh, just, you know, there's nothing to see here. Well, again, when I start reading data in reference to looking at something that can happen two to three decades down the line, uh, yeah, uh, not cool. All right, so what do we review tonight? And just as we close out, bah, 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 uh, we looked at this part here, going backwards. I'll have the links for you as well. And the, with how does severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus to affect the brain and implications of vaccine currently in use? We reviewed uh, cases of basically affecting children, multi-system inflammatory-like syndrome in children, MISC, child following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination, which led to the other one. We reviewed... I had, Hand sanitizer. Kids don't mix. Ingestion can happen through the skin. Doesn't have to be just through swallowing. Waning of SARS-CoV-2 uh, and basically of the booster. We got the idea the booster may work for two months at this point in time. After that, at least according to this particular variant, go fish. All right. Uh, or at least in reference to the, that one, the Delta. Delta variant, even the Delta, it is that bad with the Delta variant. Can you imagine how it is with the Omicron? All right, proceed. Uh, just give you an idea what vaccine effectiveness was in reference to the one thing that you not you probably hear about how bad the vaccine actually operated during the influenza pandemic of, or epidemic, whatever you want to call it, of 2018-2019. Then after that, and you just must miss that one, serine hamsters, uh, obviously, a much greater threat to them is is the um, lab personnel than obviously the Omicron because it actually had virtually no impact on the lungs to proceed. After that, infection in Delta uh, Omicron may help uh, neutralize Delta, which meaning if Omicron does not have as negative outcomes and a hospitalization and things and things like that, um, it if you if a person had to be exposed to a form of uh, coronavirus outside the common cold, Omicron to this point is the teddy bear of the bunch. And no mean to belittle it, but it does seem to offer some protective effect. And so we'll see. I don't know. Right now it seems innocent enough, but you know this no no no. All right after that, the other coronavirus is just the common cold. Offer some protection. So then again, why not that? Proceed. And after that, glycine and acetylcysteine, the observational data in reference to people that have very bad outcomes tend to be very, very depleted in glutathione. 
and then by adding a little bit of glycine and acetylcysteine, maybe you'll assist people to have a better opportunity to come out of the hospital with flying colors. And also, too, I almost forgot the research here. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen negative numbers in reference to uh, inoculation or numbers this low. Because who would bother with a two? Uh, you get the drift. And there'll be a link to this research article as well. The effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines against Omicron or Delta. All the good stuff comes out on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Again, gratitude to all the researchers involved. Gratitude to our world and data, GISA, VAERS, European database. Again, regardless of whether you agree with them or not, they're still collecting the data. And that means with this, this uh, plethora of data, it would be very unlikely if anybody was to do anything um, uh, not cool, uh, maleficence, so to say, uh, that the data eventually will expose them. If there's anything else, uh, it will expose mistakes in forming a bias and then keeping that bias uh, for reasons of virtue. You know what I mean? Again. I would like to see some extra data and research being incorporated, especially in reference to basically neurological conditions. Um, but, you know, they should, it should not be up to the researchers that are out there in the wild telling the people administering the inoculations what should be done. I mean, they should be one step ahead of the game. Instead, they seem to not even be into the same room. Yay, we succeeded with uh, an inoculation that may be effective against a variant that no longer in the wild, D614G. Yeah, there may have been many evolutions of the same virus or mutations, but there's now, you know, if you saw a carpenter using a hammer to build your house, you're hammering the nails, that makes sense. But when now when it comes to cut the two by four and that carpenter is trying to cut that piece of wood with his hammer, uh, you're gonna find another carpenter. Again, gratitude. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all once again next week. And I'll catch you next time. See you then. Uh, and happy New Year's too. See you then. Bye.